Hi there. My name is Allegra Smith, and I'm an instructor and PhD student in the Department of English at Purdue. So let's say you're working on a research project and you've got a topic idea and you've looked around in the library and on Google Scholar and through a basic web search and found a few articles, book chapters, websites that'll help you out. Now that you have all of these sources, what are you going to do with them? How do you read them, pull out the critical information, and then compile it into a format that's useful? In this video, I'll be telling you about how to take notes on your sources, how to annotate them for an annotated bibliography, and how to write useful summaries. So let's get started. So what do we do when we have a bunch of books or a bunch of articles? How do we get started with them? How do we read them in a way that's productive? How do we work smarter, not harder? There's a reading strategy called SQ3R that you may have heard of, might not have. Reading about ideas helps us to understand them, to assess content, to then question it, and maybe even to challenge it or add on to it, or to make something new out of it. So in order to do all these things, we have to engage in a reading process that first surveys what's going on to give us a sense of the chapter or article, question it, so to ask questions about it, and to ask questions of ourselves and the knowledge that we already have on the topic, then to read through it, recite back the content to ourselves, and review what's going on. And this is not only helpful for reading articles or books, for writing projects, for classes like freshman writing or business writing or technical writing, but it's also helpful when reading textbooks for our classes in psychology or biology or chemistry or political science. It's a really helpful studying strategy. So here's how SQ3R works. Before you read, you want to survey the piece of writing you're looking at. This is a strategy that we often engage in when we're trying to figure out how much of a thing we should read. So just skim through it and get a sense of what's going on in the piece. Look at titles, headings, and subheadings, captions, lists, an intro and conclusion, any call-out boxes that are highlighted. Use those critical reading skills and find the areas that are pointing at you saying, look at me, look at me. While you survey the text to look for critical information and the general lay of the land, question it. Turn headings and subheadings into questions. They'll help you to forecast what you're going to learn about the thing. And ask what you already know about the topic and what you want to know. If you're writing for an audience that's different than from yourself, this is a really good opportunity for you to put yourself in your audience's shoes too and to think about the information that they're going to need from you. Let's say you're writing a report uh, for a busy C-level executive, like a CEO or CFO. They're going to have different expectations or need different things than, say, a mother in the community who's concerned about how a program's going to impact her family. So you might question with your audience in mind, putting yourself into their shoes. Then. You're going to read the chapter, and as you read, consider those visual cues that help you find important information again. Anything that the textbook publisher has taken the time to bold or put on a colored background or put in large type is probably important for you to consider. After you're done reading a section, recite the main points back to yourself, answer the questions you ask, and you might take notes on the text or on sticky notes on it, if it's in a library book or on paper, whatever method works for you. And we'll talk about note taking in just a minute. Then you're going to want to review at the, at the end. If you take your notes in a digital form, like in a Word document, you can use Control F to find specific ideas later. Uh, you might want to play with summarizing ideas or reciting them from memory. I found that trying to teach another person about what I've just learned is really helpful for me. So when I was uh, studying in college, my roommate and I would take different classes and we'd read and take some notes and then sit there and explain the main points to each other and try to teach each other what we'd learned. And it was a great way to recall that content and to kind of cement it in our brains. Now, 
how do we take notes? Don't be afraid to write on your books. I know that you want to rent textbooks and save money, but it's a really good strategy for you to be taking notes in the margins and be able to flip back to them later. Your system of note taking is just that, yours. So you're gonna to need to find one that works best for you and helps you to condense content into chunks and remember it later. You might have different symbols or codes that work for you, or you might have a different system. For example, I have a couple of friends who are visual note takers. My friend Katie likes to take notes on sticky notes and then throw them up on a board and arrange and rearrange them. Then my friend Kristen is a sketch noter and a visual note taker. You see that there's all different kinds of alignments here in the notes that she's taking. Um, she uses different uh, capitalization methods and colors and sometimes little icons or diagrams to make sense of stuff. Here's how I take notes on books. Uh, I use lots of summarizing, so I write big ideas behind the text to paraphrase main ideas and arguments. I use symbols like check marks and stars to signal my attention. I like to number when there are um, certain parts of a thing or steps of a thing to help trigger my memory when I'm flipping through the pages later. And then I also talk back to the text. You'll see up at the top here, this kind of a grumpy face. Um, this shows where I disagree. Uh, and as a scholar, when I'm writing an article or a book chapter later and I want to express my discontent with something, it's easy for me to find it so I can then refute it. I also like to make connections. And that's part of what we're doing when we write an annotated bibliography. It's about summary, but also synthesis. And synthesizing involves connecting ideas um, in order to put your knowledge into conversation with others and to put authors in conversation with each other. You can also take notes on digital texts like PDF copies of journal articles. I highly recommend the sticky note um, and highlight function in Adobe Reader and Adobe Acrobat for doing this. And that way you save your notes. You don't have to worry about spilling coffee on a book or having to give your book back to Chig after you rented it. Um, you can have copies of these notes forever. Just make sure that you save the document before you close it out. You might take notes on paper. This is how I do that. I like writing pictures because some people are visual learners and it helps create an image in my mind that I can remember. Changing handwriting and size can not only keep you interested and awake, especially when you're taking notes in class, but also help emphasize important information or questions that you might have. And then showing relationships with ideas can, can again help to engage in that synthesis or form connections. So drawing arrows, diagramming, making timelines or lists, all can do these things. And creativity is all about connecting ideas. So that's a lot. It's hard to learn how to take notes, especially when you don't get any direct instruction in it. But there are lots of resources available at Purdue if you find yourself stuck or unsure about how to do this. The Writing Lab, uh, which is on the second floor of Hevelon Hall, has a, uh, appointments available with peer consultants where they can help you if you're struggling with how to interpret a difficult text. The Online Writing Lab, or OWL, is a world famous resource that has all kinds of guides that can help you out. And you can schedule a virtual appointment with a tutor if you'd like. There's also uh, this thing called consultation and coaching available through Purdue's Academic Success Center, where you can meet in a small group or one-on-one -on -one with an academic coach who can help you work through some of these issues. And then of course, if you're in a writing class like English 106, 420, or 421, you can stop by your instructor's office hours and talk with them about how to understand the work of the class. So after we've taken notes on our text or on paper or in a Word document or whatever, our goal is to take all these ideas and form those connections, to synthesize in order to produce knowledge from all of this information we've gathered. 
and to make it understandable, accessible, applicable, and compelling to the audience that we've either been given for an assignment or that we've identified. So how do we do this? Instructors often require you to write an annotated bibliography or annotations on text. And sometimes annotations seem kind of like a chore or a drag. Why do we have to write an annotated bibliography? No one's going to tell me to write an annotated bibliography in the workplace. And that might be true. It depends on your workplace. Lots of folks in nonprofits have to gather literature on an issue in the community or on a problem and create a literature review or problem statement on that. So they're still annotating. And lots of folks in industry have to gather information on a product or competitors or parts and put together a report. So it's the same kind of skill. No matter where you end up, if you're doing research, you've got to be able to take good notes on it, to summarize it, and to present it in whatever form your industry expects. An annotated bibli bibliography is that expected form in academia. It's a way to get you to summarize and to start connecting the dots between all the works you plan on incorporating into a major research project. So it's the skills that, that we're working on here, not necessarily the genre, that's really critical to you as a future employee. So after we find a source for our research, one that's supposed to be authoritative and relevant and timely, we need to also consider its bias or sponsorship, right? If it's reliable, if the author cites their sources, if it's credible and accurate, if the scope is appropriate for the project that you're doing, if it's timely, and if it's verifiable, if you can validate whether the claims are true or not. I know I'm breezing past these points, um, but the focus of this video lesson is not assessing sources, but writing up the data. So return to this slide later if you have any questions about that. After that, you're going to write your annotations. And typical annotated bibliographies include two paragraphs for each source, a paragraph of summary and a paragraph of synthesis. The first paragraph of an annotated bibliography, or of an annotation rather, in an annotated bibliography should give a brief one paragraph summary of the content and key points of the piece being annotated. You might want to think about the following things. What's the author's key argument here? What are their critical supporting points or ideas? And what key terms and definitions do they use? The summary should be something that's useful for you for the project that's going to come out of the annotated bibliography. So if you're writing an annotated bibliography for a research paper, you're going to want to consider the points of the source that are critical for that paper. If you're writing an annotated bibliography and working towards, say, a persuasive video, you're going to want to think about the audience for that video and what points will be most important to them. Annotations should do work for you so you're not trying to summarize a bunch of sources the night before a project is due. The second paragraph of an annotation should explain the significance of the source in relation to your overall argument. This is a place where you can talk about how you plan on incorporating the source or why it's important to your project, as well as putting it into conversation with the other sources that you plan on using, as well as thinking about your own information and argument. Again, this is where you start connecting the dots and also looking ahead to the premise of your project and how the source fits into that. While you might have written annotations or an annotated bibliography before for a class, the purpose of this annotated bibliography differs depending on who your audience is and what your purpose is for the project. So most folks have written annotated bibliographies for scholarly projects like research papers or class projects. But if you're writing for an audience that isn't scholarly, they're going to have some different needs. They read reports differently than an academic reading a scholarly paper. They think differently about things like data, persuasion, and standards of proof. And they're going to expect a different balance of verbal and visual arguments. If you write a research paper with all text, a layperson with a high school level of education isn't going to want to read it. 
So as you write your annotated bibliography and start using it to plan a project, you're going to need to plan and select your evidence accordingly. And talk about maybe how you might translate certain parts of scholarly papers or book chapters into a more accessible, visual, or multimodal form. Different types of audiences have different types of expectations, and you'll need to talk about them in your annotations accordingly. Here are a couple of examples of annotations from previous students of mine. This is one from a student who is writing an editorial about the need to get rid of the penny from American currency. So she looked at an article from Time uh, about the elimination of the penny and gave a summary of it in the first paragraph. And in the second paragraph, talked about the limitations of the argument and how she planned on filling them in later on in her own editorial. The second one is from a student who was thinking about human genetic engineering for a research paper. Again, the first half of the annotation summarizes the main argument of the piece talking about how it clearly says the genetic modification will impact human evolution negatively and giving some sub reasons for that. The second paragraph talks about how this will apply to the student's paper. And then the student starts forecasting and scaffolding his own paper. So he did some of the work of writing the paper while putting together this annotated bibliography, which helped him to get more feedback on his work and to revise it along the way. That's all that I've got for you today about note-taking, annotation, summary, and annotated bibliography. As I said, consider looking at the Purdue OWL resources for more information on this, as well as examples of annotated bibliographies across a couple of different citation formats. As always, shoot your professor a message if you have any questions about this. Happy summarizing!